Okay, our text this morning is Ephesians chapter 2. If you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles there. I'm trying to be very careful with my microphone this morning because it's a little precarious. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Uh, But as we've been doing in the past, I want to review what we've covered so far in Ephesians. You'll recall that the first chapter of Ephesians is filled with praise to glory, praise to God for the great salvation which he's wrought and for blessing his children with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians 1 describes a plan that stretches from eternity past to eternity future and it describes the role that each member of the Trinity plays in that plan. The Father has chosen us before the foundation of the world and predestined us to adoption into his family. To the, to the ultimate end that we might be holy and blameless in love. The Son has paid the price of our redemption. He's offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins, enabling God to forgive us of our trespasses. And in the Son, God has revealed the mystery of his will to us with all wisdom and insight, with a view to an end, to an end purpose of the consummation of all things in Christ. God has also made us his heritage and granted us all the privileges that go with that status. We've been sealed by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of promise. This is a mark of ownership by God and a seal of protection on all those that he's regenerated and that have become his own. The Spirit also serves as a kind of down payment for greater things to come at the end, at the, when the fullness of our salvation comes to be at, the, at Christ's return. And of course, God does all that he does to the praise of his own glory and grace. We see that all the way through Ephesians 1. We're going to see it again in Ephesians chapter 2. God does what he does. He does this great work of salvation to bring glory to himself and to magnify his grace. Chapter 1 also records Paul's prayer for those to whom he writes. And I would include us in that prayer. He had an original audience that he wrote to and he wrote the letter of the Ephesians. But uh, we're part of the church. We're part of the body of Christ. And the truths that are there are just as relevant for us today as they were for the audience that Paul first wrote to. His prayer focuses on a deeper understanding of all that God has already done for us in Christ. God has done so much for us already. And our uh, main task is to grow in that understanding of that, to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. Whether we do that is through study of the Word of God and through prayer and meditation upon these great things that God has done. Paul wants us to understand and grow in in the hope of our calling, in the riches of God's glorious inheritance in the saints, and in his power towards us who believe. It is that same power that raised Christ from the dead, that seated him at the Father's right hand and made him ruler over every other authority. And it is that Christ whom the Father has given as head of the church, that he might lead and direct us as his body. So chapter 1 is very much about all that God has done and what he's accomplished in our salvation and about our need to grow in the understanding of all that God has done. As we get to chapter 2, Paul is going to focus on the process of that salvation, including what we were before we were saved, what God did in giving us life in Christ, and what the church is now as Jew and Gentile in one body. This is a very different thing from the nation of Israel. In the latter part of chapter 2, Paul's going to talk about the fact that we as Gentiles have been brought near to God in Christ. It goes very well with what we've been studying in the covenants. We get things even ahead of the nation of Israel because of what Christ has done and because he's established his church, which is distinct from the nation of Israel. Some have called Ephesians, especially this section of Ephesians, a condensed version of the book of Romans. Romans, of course, is really Paul's treatise of salvation. He goes through justification by faith and sanctification by the Spirit. And he's going to touch on those same truths, and we're actually going to look at Romans some this morning just to get a fuller understanding of some of the things he says in Ephesians 2. So I want us to read this morning Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Uh, We're going to focus on verses 1 to 6, but I want us to read 1 through 10 just to get some more context. We we stop at verse 6, um, even though the thought continues on through verse 10, but let's read that whole section. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And you 
being dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among whom we too all formerly lived, in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, in order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ. For by grace you've been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, that no one should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now before we look in more detail in the first six verses of chapter 2, I want us just to look broadly at the structure of this passage. You'll notice that it really divides quite nicely into two sections. First is our status as sinful human beings, and then secondly as what God has done in light of our plight. And you can see that's the way Paul talks. And you being dead in trespasses and sins. And he goes on to detail how we formerly lived and, and how people, the sons of disobedience, continue to live even today. We were all among them and God chose to save us. So there's the contrast between the way that we were and the way that God was and is towards us, rich in mercy, great in love and saving us even when we were still his enemies, even when we were spiritually unresponsive to him and dead in our trespasses and sins. The other thing I want you to see is everything down to the last three lines there is really preparatory to what God does. So the last three lines are where the action verbs come in. Everything else is uh, either a participle or uh, in a what we would call a subordinate clause. It's a little bit of an English lecture right here, I guess. But the, the main verbs of the sentence are what God does in making us alive together with Christ and raising us up with Christ and seating us with Christ in the heavenly places. All three of those verbs also are verbs that are uh, talk about what God has done for us in Christ and with Christ. They're kind of jointly with Christ. So I just want you to see that structure and maybe even that will impact the next time you read the passage. Uh, it's pretty clear, I think, even as you read in your regular translation, what we were before we were saved and what God has done in saving us. So let's look now in more detail at each one of these uh, phrases. Uh, it says that we were spiritually dead. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. Death can fundamentally be defined as separation. And the Bible talks about three different kinds of death. There's physical death, which is the separation of the soul from the body, the non-material part of man from his material part. There's spiritual death, which is a separation of a human soul from God as a result of man's sin, and is characterized by uh, the re rebellion against God. And then there's eternal death. Eternal death is spiritual death that lasts forever. It's characterized by everlasting punishment with absolutely no hope of reconciliation. The Bible speaks of all three of these. Now, we should understand that death was not part of the original creation. Genesis 131 tells us that after God had finished creating all that he made in six days, he looked upon all that he had made and behold, it was very good. There was no death in the original creation. God had given man all that he needed in the Garden of Eden with only one prohibition. Moses records this for us in Genesis 2. The Lord God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you shall surely die. You know the rest of the story. Satan in the form of the serpent tempted the woman and the man well, tempted the woman, whom the Lord had given the man as a helper. Both she and the man ate of the forbidden fruit. 
And while they did not immediately die physically, they did immediately die spiritually, in that there was this separation now between God and man because of man's sin. Now, instead of enjoying the intimate fellowship with God that they had enjoyed up to that point, they hid themselves from God. They knew that they were naked and they were ashamed and there was a barrier between God and men because of sin. Their sin brought a curse upon the entire creation, a curse which included physical death. Genesis 3 records, we'll read verses 17 through 19, just a section of that curse, the part that God speaks to Adam. Then to Adam he said, Because you've listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Remember that man had been made, had been made and created and placed in the garden to tend the garden and to cultivate it, so the work itself was not part of the curse. That was something that God charged man to do from the beginning. But now it's going to become much harder. And there was going to be, the ground was not going to be his friend. It was going to produce thorns and thistles. That's what it goes on to say. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground. It's a reference to death. Because from it you were taken. For you are dust and to dust you shall return. This is how death entered into creation. Adam and Eve's rebellion and disobedience plunged the entire human race into sin. And as human beings, we all come into the world with that sin nature, with that nature of rebellion against God, with being, as the Bible describes it, in the flesh. It's an inclination that rebels against God and is alienated from God. That's what Paul means here when he says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. He's speaking of being spiritually dead. In rebellion against God, alienated from God, unaware of spiritual realities that cannot be seen, and unaware of ultimate reality, that is, the way things really are according to the Word of God. We're also in that state completely unable to do anything about it. Just as a dead man can't do anything about his condition, we are in a state of spiritual death and unable to do anything about it ourselves. Now Paul speaks about this condition in Romans 8. He compares life in the spirit after regeneration with life in the flesh before regeneration. Romans 8, 5 to 8. For those who are according to the flesh, that is, in that state in which we're all born into, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, it's at enmity against God, it sees God as his enemy. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's the state into which we are all born. That's the state into which we all are and exist until God regenerates us. It says that we're dead in, the, in sins and trespasses, that is, in the realm of those things. In this context, the two words that are used here are synonyms for deliberate and conscious false steps or transgressions, missing the mark of God's moral will. We're dead in them again in the sense that the, that's the sphere in which we exist and that's, it's our very nature to sin. That's what we do by nature. And we're dead in sin because we can do nothing of ourselves to get out of that condition. That's the heading statement of verse, verses 1 to 3. Paul's going to go on in the next two verses to spell out how that condition manifests itself in our behavior. So verse 2 says that we... Walking in rebellion against God. Walking here in the sense of conducting our lives. He uses the same verb in Ephesians 4 when he entreats us to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. Here he's talking about the way we walked or the way that we lived before we were believers. It was in the realm of sins and trespasses. And it was also along two treacherous paths. First, according to the course of this world. Now scripture is replete with warnings about the world and about the world system 
as a way of thinking and behavior that's in opposition and rebellion against God. We want to look at several passages that speak about this world system and we can get a better understanding of the character of it. We're going to see that Jesus spoke about the world and a number of the New Testament writers do as well. Remember there's a point in Jesus' ministry early on where his brothers, who don't yet believe in him as the Messiah, are encouraging him to go up to the Feast of Booths. And they're saying, look, if you're the Messiah, show yourself to the world. Make it known to everybody. And Jesus says, no, I'm not going to do that. He says in John 7, Jesus said, therefore said to them, my time is not yet at hand, but your time is always opportune. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its deeds are evil. So we can draw from that that the world hates Christ. Jesus spoke to his disciples in the upper room, and on two different occasions he talks about the world. In, in John 14, where he's referring to the promise of the coming Holy Spirit, he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not behold him or know him. But you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. So the world obviously doesn't know the Holy Spirit. The world does know that God exists. Romans 1 is very clear about that. But they don't know God the way that a believer knows God. They don't have that intimate fellowship with God that we have by means of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. <clears throat> Jesus said to the twelve in John 15, This I command you that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And John says something very similar in his first epistle in 1 John 3. Do not marvel, brethren, if the world hates you. The world hates the, so the world hates those who follow Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just something that it comes with the territory. It comes with accepting Christ as our Lord. The world hated Christ. It's going to hate us as believers. Now we're not to hate them back. In the same way that God demonstrated his love towards us while we were yet enemies, we love our enemies. That's what Jesus taught us to do. And Dia prayed about this even. And the fact that we, we demonstrate that we belong to Christ by our love. It's a powerful thing not to retaliate, but to show love towards somebody that's not being loving towards you. Paul says in his, in his instruction to the Corinthians, and the need for them to judge rightly themselves before they partake of the Lord's Supper, but when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord in order that we may not be condemned along with the world, so that we know that the world will be ultimately be condemned by God. Paul also says in Colossians 2, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. So this is something that's extremely clear to us today, is the world seeks to deceive it doesn't operate according to truth. It doesn't operate according to the Word of God. It rejects the Word of God. James 4 warns us about friendship with the world. You adulteresses. And adultery here is a sense of spiritual adultery, of embracing or trying to embrace both God and the world. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So friendship with the world is enmity or hostility towards God. And then finally in 1 John 2, John, John talks a lot about the world and the world system and the need to not to be part of it. He says in verse 15, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, and this is a really good definition of three things that characterize the world system, all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, Paul's talking about that same thing in Ephesians 2, and the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world is passing away, and also it's lust, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. So... The world is dominant right now. I mean, we all live in this world. We all are subject to the influences of the world. But we know, according to Scripture, that ultimately it's going to pass away. It's going to be destroyed. The vast majority 
of planet Earth walks according to the world system. They have no place for the true God or, their, or his claims on their lives. And Paul's point here is that we were in that condition as well. Before God turned the lights on for us, we all walked in that same way. We not only walked according to the world system, but we also walked according to the one who rules that system and its citizens. Verse 2 says, we walked according to the prince of the power of the air. Or another way to translate that is according to the ruler of the realm of the air. The ruler of the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience. This, of course, is a reference to Satan. Satan is God's ultimate adversary. That's what the word means. Satan means adversary. In another place, Paul calls him the God of this world, who has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that they might not see the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ. Satan, too, was also part of God's good, original creation, but he rebelled against God and took a third of the angels with him, and he now works very hard to oppose God and his purposes. He opposed the nation of Israel. He opposes Christ himself. He opposes the church. Satan is called here the ruler of the realm of the air because that's where he and his fellow evil angels operate, in the space above the earth, which goes all the way up to the heavenlies. We've talked about that some already in Ephesians chapter 1. Paul's going to talk about it some more, and we'll look at it in more detail when we get there. But in Ephesians 3.10 in a context where he's talking about God's bringing to light the mystery which has been in ages past hidden, he says he's done that in order that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. He's talking about satanic uh, and demonic authorities in, those, in that verse. And then, of course, in Ephesians 6, he says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against fellow human beings but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. We can't see these things. We can't see angels. The only way that we know that they exist is by the word of God. The word of God is very clear that they exist and that they exercise authority over this world system in which we live in the present age. Satan not only rules the world system as a whole, he also rules over the spiritual disposition of individuals within that system. That's what Paul means when he speaks of him as the ruler of the spirit now working in the sons of disobedience. In Hebrew thought, to be a son of something is to be characterized by that. So sons of disobedience are those who are characterized by disobedience to God. And we see an excellent illustration of this in the teaching of Jesus. Again, in John's Gospel, he's speaking to a group of Jews that have been following him, not all of them as believers, and he's contrasting his father with their father. This is in John 8, beginning in verse 38. I speak the things which I've seen with my father, therefore you also do the things which you've heard from your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you're Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. You see the definition there? He's saying, look, if that's your father, be like Abraham. Be characterized by the same kind of behavior and character that he was characterized by that. But as it is, you're seeking to kill me, a man who told you the truth, which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. You're doing the deeds of your father. They said to him, we're not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. You know, there's a number of commentators, and I happen to be, agree with them, that this is kind of a slap at Jesus. Remember, he's virgin born, but they know that Mary had become pregnant uh, before she was fully married. She was betrothed, but not fully married. And I think that this is uh, kind of a slap at, you know, we know about you. We know about your past. And they're saying, we, we weren't that way. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and have come from God. For I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It's because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, 
because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. John sums this up in this, again in his letter in 1 John 3. Little children, and again there's this illustration, this metaphor of father and children. Let no one deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous, just as God is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, that he might destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin. Now, we need to understand what he's saying there. He's not saying that as believers we never sin. He's already addressed the fact back in uh, chapter 1 that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we don't practice sin. We don't live in sin the same way that we did before we were saved. That's what he's talking about here. No one who's born of God practices sin because his seed, God's seed, abides in him. And he cannot sin. He cannot practice sin because he's born of God. By this, and this is the important statement, by this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Of course, he's talked about both of those things in his epistle. The fact that love of the brethren is a clear mark of love for God. And here, love for righteousness and practicing righteousness is a clear mark of being part of the children of God, of truly being regenerated. Unbelievers then are those who walk according to the world and what it values, who are part of the world system that Satan rules over, and also who are ruled over by Satan himself as individuals, influencing their choices and actions. Paul's going to go on to describe in verse 3 the behavior and destiny of what we were before we were saved. First, we were indulging our own lust and thoughts. Paul says that in our former state, we lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Uh, if anything characterizes life before regeneration, it's selfishness, it's living for self. Scripture is very clear that this was in opposition to God. We read about that earlier from Romans 8. Galatians 5 also speaks of this, this contrast between living in the flesh, living in the nature into which we're born, and living in the Spirit. Galatians 5, I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing. All of these are things that we see in the world today. We see the world and unbelievers characterized by these things. All these things are, are at least a number of these things, depending on when we came to faith in Christ, characterized us as well. These are the way human nature is. Things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So clearly, he's, he's talking here about unbelievers. He says later in chapter 6, Do not be deceived, but God, for God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh shall from the flesh reap corruption. Corruption, another way to translate that word, is death, destruction. But the one who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap eternal life. Now Paul, go, Paul also describes what living according to the flesh, where that leads, uh, apart from regeneration, in Romans 1. He's talking about uh, the Gentiles here. And the fact that they have an innate knowledge of God. God's made himself known to all men. He's done that through the creation. He's also done it by the virtue of the fact that we're made in the image of God. The problem is not that man doesn't know that God exists. The problem is that he suppresses that truth in unrighteousness. And this is what Paul, this is where that leads. Romans 1 beginning at verse 28 
Just as they, that is men, did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. All you have to do is pick up a newspaper or listen to a newscast and you can see these kinds of things show up every single day in, around the world. And although they know the ordinance of God, here's the striking part. They know these things are wrong. They know it again because God has made, as part of human nature, he's also made man in the image of God. So he has a built-in sense of right and wrong. Although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. So humankind, left in his own depravity, only does all kinds of evil. He not only does evil, but he also gives approval to other people who do evil, even though they know it's wrong. This kind of thing, this kind of living according to our own lusts and living according to the course of the world and at the direction of Satan made us children of wrath. We talked about this phrase, sons of disobedience, earlier. In this case, children of wrath means God's wrath. And it's, that's the destiny of those who live this way. Again, Romans 1 speaks of a current wrath of God in verse 18, it says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. That's God's currently giving men over to their sin and they're suffering the consequences of it, even in this life. But just like so much of our salvation is still to be revealed in the future, much of God's wrath against an unbelieving world is still to come, still future. Paul talks about this and really contrasts the destiny of believers with those who don't believe at Christ's return. For God has not destined us, as believers, for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. The wrath that he's speaking of in that context is the wrath associated with the day of the Lord. He talks about it again in 1 Thessalonians 5. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying, and he's talking about people that are on the earth at that time, and they think things are going pretty well. While they're saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly, like birth pangs upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. This is the wrath, of course, that Jesus laid out in the Olivet Discourse, and it's given its full explanation in the seven sealed scroll in the book of Revelation. You remember that after the first six seals are broken, in Revelation chapter 6, those that are on the earth say, To the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne, that's the Father, and from the wrath of the Lamb, that's the Son. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? There's certainly opportunities for repentance even through the wrath of the day of the Lord, but those who refuse to repent will pay for the penalty of eternal destruction, away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Again, Romans 2 divides all of humanity up into two classes. Uh, verses 7 through 10 of Romans 2 says, To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. So in that, in that verse is aim, that is, they seek for immortality and eternal life. It's character. They persevere in doing good. And it's destiny, eternal life, or reward is another way to think of that. So that's one class of humanity, one group. In contrast, those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. So again, there's character, there's aim, and there's reward. And then he backs out and says the same thing, uh, reversing the order. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. 
but glory and honor and peace to every man who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now you might read that and think, well, that sounds like salvation by works, right? He's talking about doing good and seeking for glory and honor. Well, you only do those things as a Christian because of what God has already done in your life. It's a result of salvation. It's not that you're earning your salvation, and that's what we're going to talk about more next week. The scripture is very clear that you cannot, by any work, earn salvation. It's just as clear that good works are a result of saving faith, and that's what he's talking about here. In the same way, those who are not saved, those who have not been regenerated, their works are what give evidence that they haven't been saved. Whenever the Bible talks about judgment and judging humankind, it's according to works, even in this passage in Romans 2. But works are a manifestation of belief in God and in his gospel or non-belief. And so that's why works are the evidence of, of faith or not faith. Paul's been describing what we were before we became believers and what those who don't believe in Christ still are. He especially deals with our attitude and our actions toward God. Now, in the second half, he shifts to God's contrasting attitude and actions towards us in light of our plight. In verse 4, uh, verses 4 and the first part of verse 5 speak of God's attitude towards us. In contrast to our attitude of rebellion towards God, which was in keeping with our character as unregenerated sinners, God, in keeping with his character, demonstrated mercy, love, and grace towards us. Verse 4 says, God being rich in mercy. We can define grace as God's giving us what we don't deserve, giving us these great spiritual blessings that we've read about in Ephesians chapter 1. Mercy, then, is, can be properly defined as God's withholding from us the things that we do deserve, particularly his judgment. Of course, God was only able to spare us that judgment and the punishment that we did deserve from our sins because Christ took it in our place. Let's look at a couple of passages that speak of God's mercy towards us. He says in his letter to Titus, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness, there's that fact that we're not saved by works, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And then Peter says in 1 Peter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. There's a lot there in, in that passage that corresponds with what we're reading about in Ephesians 1. The fact that we're saved um, according to God's mercy and by his grace, we're saved through faith, and our salvation is still, in, in uh, a great way, still to be revealed at the last time. Secondly, God's attitudes or attitude towards us was great with love. That's what the last part of verse 4 says. He acted because of his great love with which he loved us. Of course, this is agape love. It's a love that is uh, the highest kind of love. It seeks what's best for the person being loved without regard to any merit or attractiveness on their part. So this is the love, of course, that uh, a verse that we all know, John 3.16, speaks about God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. He was motivated by love. He also helped us when we were helpless to help ourselves. God did what he did while we were still dead in our transgressions and sins. We made no movement towards God. He chose us at the beginning. He called us at a certain point during our lives. He opened our eyes and regenerated us. Uh, he gave us faith to believe. You know, there's not much that a dead man can do for himself. He needs one thing. He needs life. And that's what God did for us. Paul also describes God's love and our helplessness in Romans 5. Romans 5 beginning in verse 6 says, For while we were still helpless, 
At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. You see the point he's making there? We weren't even good. We weren't in any way like God or desirous of God. Uh, we might die for somebody that we loved, a member of our family or somebody that we admired. We might lay down our life for them. We, it's very, we would be very reluctant to lay down our life for somebody that hated us and that was enemies with us. And that's his point here is that while we were still enemies, God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we should be saved from the wrath of God through him, through Christ. Well, that was God's attitude towards us. It was full of mercy. It was great with love. It was helping us even when we were helpless to help ourselves. Let's look now at his actions towards us. And this gets down to that, uh, those three action verbs that I was talking about earlier when we were looking at the passage as a whole. There are three main verbs here. First, he made us alive together with Christ. There's only one thing that can help a dead man, as I said, and that is the gift of life. That's what God did. He's the only one that could do that because God is the only one that gives life. I mentioned earlier that death was separation, and Christ's death on the cross was more than just a physical death. It was more than just the separation of his soul from his body, even though that was part of what happened at the cross. Christ also endured separation from the Father, not because of his sin, because he had not committed any sin, but because of ours. So he endured spiritual death. He was separated from God. He endured the wrath of God for the sins of the world. Because he endured that separation and paid the price of our sins, God can justly give us spiritual life while we're still dead in our trespasses and sin. God did that by his grace, his unmerited favor towards us. And it's almost like Paul can't help himself here when he says, kind of parenthetically, for by grace you have been saved. He's going to take that up more fully in verses 8 and 9, and that's when we'll look at it. It's next week. But I will say here that God's grace is a condition into which we enter at the point of our conversion and remain in for the rest of our lives. God's grace keeps us safe from his wrath forever. Okay? God made us alive together with Christ. He also raised us up with Christ. Uh, remember, that's the same thing he did for Christ. He raised him from the dead. That's what we saw at the end of chapter 1. This is a resurrection not, this is not talking about, when he talks about raising us up with Christ, he's not talking about our future bodily resurrection. He's talking about a resurrection to spiritual life that we have as a result of union with Christ. I want us to look at Romans 6 because Paul talks about that in detail in that passage. Romans 6, beginning in verse 3 says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, and I think... No, you could see this as baptism, water baptism. It's really the picture of the spiritual baptism that we undergo when we're converted. We're baptized into Christ Jesus by the Spirit of God. All those who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death in order that Christ, as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So again, water baptism pictures the spiritual reality of spirit baptism. We're taken down into the water that's being buried with Christ, with him into death, and then we're raised up to walk in newness of life. That's resurrection life for us. It's the same power that God demonstrated in raising Christ physically from the dead. He gives us that power to live for him spiritually today. For if we've become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. So we were joined together with Christ in his death and crucifying our old self. Doesn't mean that our old self has been completely done with. We still have to struggle against the flesh, even as regenerated believers. And that will continue until the day we die. But there's a sense in which that old self has been crucified with Christ. And we have a new power by the Spirit of God living in us to enable us and empower us to live the Christian life. 
For he who has died is freed from sin. Now if we've died with Christ, we believe that also we shall also live with him. That is, again, I think that's talking about living with him today. Living with him in the sense of him dwelling in us through the Spirit of God. Certainly it ultimately means resurrection life in the future as well. I think this passage is talking about the resurrection life that we have now, Christ's resurrected life living within us. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. It's no longer master over us either, because we have the life of Christ in us. Paul says something else in Colossians chapter 2. In him, that's in Christ, you are also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also, you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So again, it's, it's picturing the death and burial and resurrection of Christ, which did happen physically, and it's joining our spiritual death and resurrection with Christ to that act. Colossians 3, if then you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. Of course, these are the new values that come with regeneration life. It's opposing the world's values. It's, it's not living the way that we used to according to the world system. That's what Paul means when he says keep your mind set on the things above. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. So he's talking about the reality of this spiritual union with Christ that's already taken place. And what future salvation does, the future aspect of salvation, it reveals that. It makes it known. At that point, we get resurrected bodies. We're glorified and we share in the glory of God. It's the revelation of the glory of God and the children of God. Christ was raised physically from the dead. We were raised from being spiritually dead in our trespasses and sins. And because we're united with Christ in his death and resurrection, we'll one day be raised physically from the dead just as he was. Well, finally, God seated us, seated us in the heavenly places in Christ. That's what the last part of verse 6 says. As God raised Christ and seated him in the heavenly realm physically, so he's raised us and seated us with him in that same realm spiritually. It's our union with Christ that enables us to be in that place. This position gives us as believers a heavenly power that overcomes the power of sin and death. And again, this is very much a power that we access today as we live our lives for Christ. Our lives continue on this earth for God's glory, but our true citizenship and our true character is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I was reading MacArthur's commentary, and I thought he had a really good summary of uh, this fact that we've been raised up and seated with Christ in the heavenly places. It's not something that we, again, we may not think about this as often as we should, but we've been joined together with Christ He's at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly places now, and we, in spiritual union with him, are there as well. Here's the way Mark MacArthur describes it, and we'll close with this. Even though we're not yet inheritors of all that God has for us in Christ, to be in the heavenly places is to be in God's domain instead of Satan's. To be in the sphere of spiritual life instead of the sphere of spiritual death. This is where our blessings are, and where we have fellowship with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and with all the saints who have gone before us and will go after us. This is where all our commands come from, that is, from Christ, who's at the Father's right hand, and where all our praise and petitions go to. And someday, we'll receive the inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for us. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, these are great truths. We thank you for your word that reminds us that we have, uh, through spiritual union with Christ, died to sin 
and been raised to walk in newness of life. That that same power that you demonstrated in raising Christ from the dead dwells in us and enables us to overcome temptation, to overcome sin, to live a life of holiness and purity for you. We thank you for that power. We thank you that as you mature us through the process of sanctification, you have as the ultimate goal our glorification, our full sharing of the glory of Christ, and our intimate fellowship with Christ and with you because of what you've done in, in eradicating sin in our lives. Thank you for that time, Father. I uh, thank you for that work that you've done. And I pray that uh, you would keep us mindful of these things as we meditate upon them and uh, as we express our joy and worship to you through them. We, we thank you for the time we've had together this morning. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.